So Scott, Scott, are you related to the architect artist? Um, I, I so uh, in the United States, Gaudi is a very unusual last name. There's only about a couple, maybe a hundred of us in the United States. Um, but my ancestry is, as far as I know, uh, Italian, not Catalonian or Spanish. So what we think is that um, people emigrated from Spain to Italy a long time ago because um, Gaudi is a much more common surname in Italy and, and very common in, in Catalonia and then and then moved here. Um, so I guess probably <laughs> is the answer to your question, but distantly, if so. Um, I've yet to actually visit that part of, I actually yet to visit Spain, particularly that part. Um, I feel like I'm might be a you know local celebrity when I do. <laughs> we took my kids to Barcelona several years ago, quite a few years ago, and my son was very young and he'd been churched out. You know, you see it right. after the tenth church, it's enough churches. But he was very impressed with Sagrada Familia, the cathedral there. Yeah, yeah. I've heard it's impressive. It, um, uh, amusingly, I don't actually like Gaudi's architecture. <laughs> it's too, it's too, uh, too over uh, the top. Ornate. Yeah, I, I am much more of a minimalist and modernist. So, yeah, that's my feeling when I go into a Baroque church. You know, it's like they went for Baroque. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> and once you've seen twenty cherubs, that's it. When I go to Italy, or ha so many years now ago, it's like you see everything is churches, mm -hmm. and and the church art and. Well, one of the things in Italy is to see some of the great master paintings. You have to go to churches because the church is what supported these artists, and yeah. so you know yet another Titian, but it's in a church. Yeah. But the Gaudi Cathedral was quite special. That was something. So David, I guess I've been asked to do the introduction. Is that right? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, we'll give it an, uh, till yeah, our minutes. usual two minutes after. Mm -hmm. People will come flooding in. So, Bill, it's your your call. Okay, I guess come. we're yeah, I guess we're at the uh, requisite uh, two minutes after the hour, so we can go ahead and, and get started. And it is my real pleasure to welcome uh, Scott Gowdy, to, who will give a CPSH seminar today. Many of you who were here back for the um, pop-up seminar in planetary habitat.
sustainability in 2018. We'll remember that uh, Scott was one of our guest speakers at that, and that is what led to the creation of the, uh, the center. And so we're delighted to welcome Scott back. Um, Scott got his uh, undergraduate degree at Michigan State and his PhD at Ohio State. He then did a um, Hubble Fellowship at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton and a Menzel Fellowship at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. And he is now the Thomas Jefferson Professor for Discovery and Space Exploration in the Department of Astronomy at, back at Ohio State University. And today he is going to tell us about NASA's next great observatory, a large UV optical near infrared telescope capable of characterizing nearby habitable worlds. So take it away, Scott. Thanks. Um, and thanks for the invitation. <clears throat> um, it's great to be back. Um, I really enjoyed myself last time I was here for that um, for that workshop. Um, interestingly, a lot of the things that um, I talked about during that workshop or was discussed um, now have come uh, to fruition, which I think is, is quite exciting. I apologize for this uh, long name uh, for this talk. Um, we don't actually have a name for this new uh, telescope. That will be uh, that will be built and launched sometime in the next uh, I don't know twenty years or something. Um, so when that happens, this will be will be a much shorter title. Um, and I should say that it's not actually correct. This is not NASA's next great observatory. That will actually be Roman, um, which I'll be talking about tomorrow during my colloquium. So uh, with that, those caveats. Um, let me. I want to give a little bit of backstory of how we got to where we are with um, with this tele with this great observatory. Um, so. The past decade has been quite busy, um, and uh, and I've been involved with a fair amount of strategic planning activities, starting with 2013, uh, where NASA started uh, or NASA initiated a, a roadmap, um, enduring quest during visions, which I'll talk about. Um, then subsequent to that, uh, Paul Hertz gave a charge to the program analysis groups groups of NASA, um, which I'll also discuss, which led to mission concept studies. Um, one of which, uh, two of which were the Habitable Exoplanet Observatory and the Large UV Optical Infrared uh, Observatory, which, um, which those two, or some form of those two were prioritized by the Astro 2020 Decadal Survey, which just came out uh, last year. So this roadmap um, was, uh, was started in 2014, and basically the idea was to um, present a science-driven 30-year vision for the future of NASA astrophysics to address its uh, central key questions, are we alone? How did we get here and how does the universe work? Um, and this committee, there was a, a roughly 15 or 20 people on the committee, I don't remember, experts in their own field across all areas of astronomy. Um, and we were tasked to come up with this, this vision um, without uh, being unencumbered by financial constraints, which, uh, which made it a lot of fun. It actually was one of the most fun committees I've ever been a part of. Um, and so, um, so uh, 22 scientists, right? Um, and this is a subset of the people here. I'm actually not pictured in this. Um, and we were, we had several different meeting, in-person meetings and then um, remote meetings where we uh, developed this vision and roadmap, um, which we then gave back to NASA. Um, and, uh, and this is a very common kind of exercise. We've heard a lot of it, uh, but this was a little bit different in that we were at task to come up with, to do things in, in epochs or eras, the near term things that sort of are happening or, or will be happening soon formative 2020s and then visionary. Um, but we also, other than just ideas for science, we also had to talk about missions, um, at least very notional mission concepts. Um, and, um, and that made it somewhat different. And, and, and these weren't well-developed missions, but they were the nuggets of ideas that led to these great observatory studies. Um, so what came out of it is um, we ad addressed the sort of science priorities on these three, uh, these three areas. Um, and we had, you know, su uh, questions that were su subsets of each one of these larger questions, and then we kind of mapped onto those um, how we would answer those questions with the existing telescopes, for example, our exoplanets at the time, Kepler was still going, Hubble, Spitzer, and Tess, um, upcoming telescopes, James Webb, w First AFTA, which is now Roman, and then Louvoir Surveyor, for example, which was a, which was a, co a mission concept that we came up with for kind of the next successor to Hubble that could directly image and characterize Earth-like planets around nearby sun-like stars, which is what I'm going to talk about today. We even talked about Exo-Earth Mapper, which was a, a, a suite of eight-meter telescopes which could actually resolve the surface of a, of a habitable planet, nearby habitable planet, which so it's a pretty crazy idea, but again, this was a sort of 30-plus year roadmap. 
Okay, and so out of this study came three mission concepts. Um, very, again, very notional, Louvoir surveyor, which I just mentioned, a far infrared surveyor and an X-ray surveyor. And based on this roadmap, um, Paul Hirsch uh, issued a charge to the program analysis groups. So the program analysis groups are um, kind of advisory bodies that, um, or bodies that do analysis, um, which is then fed to the APAC, the Astrophysics Analysis um, Advisory Committee, which is the main advisory committee for NASA astrophysics. Um, and so they kind of solicit community input um, and then do analysis and then provide that as input to the, um, to the APAC. Um, and this is one of the main ways in which NASA gets input um, sort of in between decadal surveys or mid-decadal reviews. Uh, and so he, he charged the PAGs to, to, to you know, canvas the community and comment on a small set of mission concepts uh, that should be studied in advance of the Astro 2020 Decadal Survey. Um, and he, um, he gave a list of four possible mission concepts. Uh, three of these were drawn from this roadmap committee, the Far IR Surveyor, Optical, UV Optical and Fred Surveyor, and the X-ray Surveyor. And then one was actually drawn from the Astro 2010 Decadal Survey, which is HabEx. And, um, and so uh, I was actually chair of the ExoPAG at the time. Uh, I went around uh, trying to get, again, uh, collate input from the exoplanet community as to what uh, mission concepts we should study, uh, not just for exoplanets, but in general. Uh, and then I talked to the other PAG chairs, uh, the COPAG and FISPAG chair, and uh, went to a lot of meetings, went all over the country. A lot of work was put into this. And at the end of the day, um, we basically agreed uh, all three PAGs agreed that um, the four large mission concepts that were that Paul presented to us should all be studied and independently. Um, so the joke is that you know probably uh, Paul Hertz just wanted us to give him a post-it note saying yes, study these four large missions, but we did due diligence and made sure that the community was on board with this. Um, so that led to these large mission concepts. So um, so in late 2015, there was a call for people to apply to become part of science and technology definition teams for these four large mission concepts. Uh, and then early 2016, those um, those uh, the people that were selected were those were announced, and the, the studies started. Um, and so these went these studies went on for almost a full four years. So these were quite involved studies. There was a lot of money, person hours, time uh, spent, a lot of meetings, a lot of telecons, as you can imagine, spent on these studies. They were quite in depth. Um, and these actually led to um, what I will call the next great observatories um, once these mission concepts were studied. So, um, and the reports were submitted in late 2019. And talking a little bit more about these studies, um, they uh, again, they were science and technology definition teams. So the, not only was the science um, discussed and, and studied in depth, but also how that mapped to the, the, the sort of architecture of the missions capable of achieving that science and the technology needed to realize those mission concepts. So these are pictures from the first Louvoir meeting and the first HabEx meeting. And each of these studies, the four were centered at uh, NASA Center. So HabEx was centered at JPL. Origins, Louvoir was centered at Goddard, and uh, Lynx was centered at Marshall. And uh, we had engineers, manager, managers, um, and scientists. Um, we had um, people from industry being involved in some ways, uh, and we had international observers as well. Uh, so it was really a, a kind of a team effort drawing from all areas, all aspects of the astronomical community. Um, and so, like I said, these were so the final reports were submitted in late 2019 in August. Um, and then presented to the Astro 2020 EOS 1 and EOS 2 panels in 29, late 2019. These studies were different because the goal was um, basically to come up with fairly well vetted mission concepts that um, could be, uh, could be um, judged and prioritized by decision makers, in particular the Astro 2020 Decadal Survey. So the studies were both longer and more detailed than previous Decadal Survey concept studies. Um, these concepts were some of the most mature concepts that were had ever been presented to the Decadal Survey. Um, there was lots of um, um, work done on um, on uh, trades, architecture trades, scaling of the of the uh, ambition, uh, primary mirror size, etc. Uh, there was a lot of discussion and a lot of thought went into the technology development plan plans, cost and schedule to develop the missions for uh, pre phase A or pre new start in the um, in by NASA. And the hope was that we would sort of, you know, um, we would sort of uh, not re, uh, re uh, revisit the sins of the past, 
um, by um, having a mission concept that was very mature um, and technologies that were um, enabling technologies that were well identified so that um, so that the mission could be developed in a reasonable amount of cost um, and on on schedule. Um, and so that was the that was the main goal of these studies. So um, as you can imagine, they study different wavelength ranges. Uh, Lynx is X-ray, uh, similar to Chandra. Luvoir and Habex are the ultraviolet optical near infrared, and then Origins is the far infrared. Um, and so now I'm going to talk about in specifically the two mission concepts, Luvoir and Habex, because they're um, both relevant to this seminar, but also um, very similar in um, in terms of their science goals. So. Uh, Pretty early on in the process, we recognized that people um, might wonder why we're studying both Luvoir and Habex if they had similar science goals and, and somewhat similar capabilities. Um, and we wanted to disabuse people of the notion that these two studies were in competition with each other. Um, so we worked closely from the very beginning. Um, we have team members in common from both the STDTs. Uh, we had joint telecons and joint meetings. Uh, where we just sort of discussed what we learned, um, where we were going, and how we should coordinate our studies together. So we developed this uh, this statement from the the main leadership of the both SDDTs, uh, which says you know the Habex and Louvoir science technology teams have devoted a lot of time on these studies. Um, we presented a, a total of eleven different architectures, two for Louvoir and nine for Habex. Um, and we've collaborated since the beginning. Um, and the idea was to offer a buffet of options to the Astro 20 Decadal Survey um, uh, with corresponding flexibility and budgeting and phasing so that the Astro 2020 could really make a well-informed decision as to what kind of, um, what kind of mission was um, both uh, appealing in terms of the science reach, but also uh, possible to do in a reasonable amount of time for a reasonable cost. And um, both missions agreed that although one of the primary goals was certainly to directly image and characterize Earth-like planets around sun-like stars, uh, that we also agreed that um, a general astrophysics should be a, cap uh, should be a capability of these two mission concepts. So, um, so this idea of directly imaging and characterizing Earth-like planets around near like, nearby sun-like stars and potentially looking for life obviously is not new. Uh, there have been many studies that have considered this and many different reports that have uh, prioritized this as something that we, you know, as a society and as the NASA astrophysics and the general U.S. astrophysics and world astrophysics community wants to achieve in these uh, in various um, reports, uh, including most sort of more uh, most recently before the Astro 2020, the Exoplanet Science Strategy um, by the National Academy of Sciences. And, uh, and these all these um, various studies concluded that, you know, you really have to go to space and do direct spectroscopy for Earth-like planets around sun-like stars, at least if you want to do this in the optical and reflected light. Of course, you can do this in a thermal infrared in around 10 microns, but that is very different architecture, um, and the trades there are very different. And as a community, at least in the U.S., we have by and large uh, prioritized doing direct spectroscopy in the optical um, as the first, sort of first part of the path, not the, the only, but as the first, with something like a mid-infrared interferometer going later. So um, just as a reminder, you know, the challenge in directly detecting Earth-like planets around nearby sun-like stars and taking their spectra, um, the goal, of course, is to get spectra that look like this. This is actually an Earthshine spectrum of the Earth uh, taken by uh, Maggie Turnbull and collaborators. Um, from the UV, uh, near UV, all the way to the uh, sort of uh, two microns, roughly. Um, and you can see lots of interesting features. Of course, you can see this rise towards the blue at the very blue spectrum. That's blue part of the spectrum. That's Raleigh scattering. So that would be indicative of an atmosphere. Um, there's absorption by oxygen in various places. Um, if you can go to the UV, there's a big plummet because of ozone. Um, you can see absorption by water vapor carbon dioxide, and here in the very far and uh, very far part of the red spectrum in the near infrared, um, there's features due to methane as well. And so all of these are indications that the Earth is not only uh, habitable, but also inhabited. Um, so in order to do this, of course, you have to, uh, you have to basically separate light from the photons from the, the, the planet and uh, from the star and then take spectrum of that. Um, and the challenge, of course, is that the Earth is roughly 10 billion times fainter than the Sun, and of course, uh, at 10 parsecs, so is separated by 0.1 arc seconds. So the analogy I often use is it's trying to, like trying to detect a firefly about a few feet away from an industrial searchlight, 
that you would see in Hollywood premieres, except the Firefly and the Searchlight are in Los Angeles and you're standing in New York City. Um, and so that's you know, a pretty terrifying kind of uh, challenge to undertake. Uh, but actually it turns out, and I think I may have mentioned this in 2018, uh, is that uh, Firefly is actually about a thousand times brighter compared to a searchlight than the Earth is compared to the sun. So the actual problem is a thousand times harder than even that terrifying analogy would apply. Um, of course, we have two main methods of doing this. Um, we have, um, sorry, we have coronography. Let's see if this is actually going to work. Oh, yeah. We have coronography where um, we actually let the light um, from the star into um, light from the star into the aperture. Uh, and, um, and then um, we try to block that light using a, a coronagraph. Uh, but of course, you know, light is a wave and so diffracts, uh, which means that we have to, uh, and so when you have an imperfect wavefront coming in, uh, you actually have to correct that wavefront in order to avoid speckles, which are uh, many, many times, many tens of times brighter than the, the sort of 30th magnitude Earth that you're looking for. So this, this animation kind of shows exactly how this works for a chronograph, light comes in, you have an aberrated wavefront, uh, which, uh, which makes your life difficult. Um, you put in a chronograph, um, and then you put in a Leo stop. There's your chronograph mask. And there's various different fancy chronograph masks you can use. There's your uh, scatters light to the outside, put in your uh, Leo stop. Um, and ideally, uh, that would be all you need to do. But of course, you have uh, scattering uh, speckles. Do, and of course, the planet go, is off axis. So therefore, it passes through the chronograph unscathed, more or less. Um, and ideally, this is all you need. But of course, due to the fact that, uh, that you have this aberrated wavefront, you get residual speckles that are, that are you know, orders of magnitude brighter than, than your planet. Um, and so you have to actually flatten the wavefront, and you do that using a, de a deformable mirror. Uh, so that all sounds quite quite simple in principle. In practice, it's a lot harder. It's important to note that the Roman Space Telescope is actually going to be the first telescope to um, to actually uh, do active wavefront control and coronography in space. Uh, so it'll be a great test bed uh, for uh, and technology proving ground for uh, these future missions. Um, and then the other way to do this, um, which is which is the one that I think is cool. Um, particularly cool is using a star shade. Here, you don't actually let the light from the st star into the telescope. Instead, you have a star shade for Habex. This is a 52 meter diameter, so roughly the size of a baseball diamond star shade that has the shape uh, and the, that actually blocks the light from the star, but then the off axis light from the planet can get into the telescope. And here, you know, you, you don't really need fancy optics in your telescope, you just need an imager. Um, and, uh, and you don't need a very, uh, very, you know, fancy telescope itself, because the stability of the telescope doesn't really matter because you're not actually trying to block the light from the, the host star. Um, so uh, you can get very, very deep contrast um, and broad wavelength uh, coverage using a, a star shape. So those are our two main ways of doing this, this technique. And now I'm going to talk about how Habex and Louvoir actually do those uh, use those to actually directly detect and characterize Earth-like planets. Okay, so Habex, our study philosophy we developed very early on, um, and it was guided by the philosophy of developing a mission capable of the most compelling science possible while still adhering to likely cost technolo technology risk and schedule constraints. So we really wanted to be very um, conservative in a lot of ways uh, while still being able to achieve this very difficult goal. Um, and we also uh, prioritized uh, general astrophysics sort of in the nature of Hubble uh, as an equal science goal of HABEX. Um, and so uh, although a lot of the telescope architectures and trades were driven by the exoplanet science goal, um, they were not uniquely so. There were actually aspects of the um, mission design that were driven by the general astrophysics science. Um, all of the technologies in HabEx are TRL-4 or above. Um, so if ever we, um, we wanted a capability that would require a lower TRL technology, um, we chose uh, instead to not have that capability. Um, but nevertheless, we are still able to get a very, um, very exciting mission um, by making those decisions. Um, and our, our low, lowest TRL, lowest uh, developed, least developed technologies are related to coronography, the starshade, low noise detectors, and large mirrors. 
Um, and we also considered um, eight other low cost, lower cost architectures, again, with the idea of develop, of giving the uh, decadal survey a, a buffet of options what they get the, that they could choose from when trying to prioritize uh, such a mission. Um, and so this was the, the preferred architecture we came up with. Um, and I just mentioned this more for historical reasons than anything else. It's important to realize that both the HabEx and Louvoir studies are done, and whatever gets built in the future is not going to be either HabEx or Louvoir. It's going to be some combination of both um, and also obviously something new. So we uh, came up with a monolithic telescope. So monolithic uh, apertures make for make coronography a lot easier. Um, so uh, we came when the largest monolith that you can do without sort of tor torturing yourself in various ways is a sort of four meter. And off-axis also makes it very um, coronography much better. So we came up with a four meter off-axis monolith, aluminum coated monolith. Aluminum coating is interesting because we want the aluminum coating to be able to get into the UV, which was important both for the exoplanet science goals, but also for the general astrophysics. It had been thought before these studies um, that aluminum was actually coating was actually bad for coronography because it in introduced polarization errors. Um, and, uh, and, but we did our own study of this and actually found that that isn't the case, um, particularly if you, if you are looking, if you have a particular cor uh, coronographic mask and actually aluminum does better in a lot of ways. Um, so that allowed us to do aluminum coated monolith, al aluminum coated primary mirror, and also for Louvoir, though theirs wasn't monolithic. Um, so that's just an example of one thing that was learned in the, in the, in these studies, which, you know, we can carry forward when helping to, helping to develop the six meter. We had four instruments, which I'll talk more about here in a second. Um, the, the telescope was quite heavy, uh, prim, uh, partially because of the primary mirror, but also because we really wanted to make the telescope very rigid, uh, which helps for coronography as well. So, um, so you know, the launch vehicles would be something like an SLS Block 1B. Um, and of course, you want to go to L2 orbit because it's just a very nice environment, particularly for coronography. We envisioned a launch of mid-2030s. Um, the Decadal Survey envisions a launch for the, 20, for the six meter of 2045. Hopefully that can be shortened because that's a long time from now. Um, we imagine five years with a capability of four years, uh, 10 years, sorry, for the mission duration. Um, and we had a, a chronograph and a star shape, which I'll talk about here in a second. So these are the four instruments. Two of them were for general astrophysics in the, in the sort of theme of Hubble, wide field imaging camera and spectrograph and then a high, high resolution UV imager and spectrograph. And then we had two instruments for the direct imaging and spectroscopy of Earth-like planets, one for the chronograph. So this is a very complicated instrument with chronographic masks and uh, an active wavefront control, et cetera. Uh, we imagined a raw contrast of 2.5 times 10, or sorry, a final contrast of 2.5 times 10 to the minus 10, inner working angle of 2.4 lambda over D. And then, a spectrograph with a resolution of 140 in the visible and 40 in the infrared. So lo relatively low resolution. Of course, the features that we're looking for in Earth-like spectra are generally pretty broad. And then for a starshade instrument, uh, we had a very broad band pass from 200 to 1800 nanometers. No, we did not have a UV coronagraph. Uh, UV coronography seems like it's probably pretty hard, uh, and um, uh, but you know maybe not maybe not impossible. Um, our contrast was 10 to the minus 10. So star shade gives you very deep nulls and very good contrast. Um, inner working angle is actually not set by lambda over D because you're not letting the light into the telescope. It's set by the, the size of the star shade and its distance from the telescope. So it's 52 meters flying about 75,000 uh, kilometers away from the telescope. That gives you an inner working angle of about 58 milliarc seconds. Then one of the nice things about star shade, it has a very large outer working angle. The outer working angle of a coronagraph is set by the number of actuators you have to correct your uh, you correct your wave, wave front, but an outer working angle of the star shade is basically set by how big your detector is. Um, so you can have very large outer working angles, which allows you to probe the very outskirts of planetary system, nearby planetary systems. And the UV uh, and the spectrometer was an IFS with similar sort of resolutions in the UV visible and near infrared as the uh, as the current. So why did we do a star shade and a chronograph? Well, um, it turns out these two methods of starlight suppression are very complementary. So a chronograph is very nimble because it's on the telescope. So you can move the telescope around. Uh, so it's really good for blind searches. But unfortunately, uh, chronographs are inherently chromatic. So you can only have a narrow instantaneous band pass where you're really correcting the wavefront well. Um, and, uh, and so 
Um, if you want to build up a spectrum, a broadband spectrum, you have to take many narrow uh, uh, band passes. So that means many different channel, several different channels in your, in your chronograph and, and several different filters. And so that can that's very time consuming, obviously. So that means that chronographs are really good for finding potentially Earth-like planets and measuring their orbits, uh, but not so very not so good at taking their spectra. Now the starshade, on the other hand, has a wide instantaneous band pass, a high throughput large outer working angle, small inner working angle, and it's great for spectral characterization, as you can take a, a sort of 100% bandwidth spectrum uh, instantaneously, and you don't have to do it sequentially like you have to do with the chronograph. Um, but star shades are slow, because it takes about two weeks to go from target to target. Of course, the targets are located all over the sky. Um, and so you're, uh, the number of targets you can slew to are ultimately limited by both time and fuel. Uh, and you require a separate launch. So the idea would be that you would go and you would find the good candidates for characterization with the chronograph, um, see if they, you know, if you find some point of light that looks like it might be in the Havel zone, measure the orbit to ensure that it is, get phase curves from the chronograph in a sort of single filter to make sure that it's, uh, it's behaving like a planet and not some piece of dust in the, um, or some clump of dust in the, in the, the system. And then once you're pretty sure it's a good candidate, then you slew your star shade there and you get your spectrum. Um, so that's that's kind of uh, HabX, and I'm going to talk about the science and yield of these, and and, and once I finish talking about the architectures of both. So Louvoir was a much more ambitious concept uh, concepts. Um, there are two Louvoir designs: uh, Louvoir A, which is an on-axis 15 meter aperture, and Louvoir B, which is an off-axis 8 meter ap aperture. And here, uh, because these are segmented apertures, you have to be careful of defining what you mean by uh, diameter. Um, and here, it's the it's the diameter of a circle that fully circumscribes um, the the mirror itself, rather than inscribes the mirror. Um, so that that'll become important when I talk about the the mission prioritized by the 2020 Decadal Survey. Uh, they also can. They also for were from near you or from UV to to mid infrared or sorry near infrared, four candidate instruments. Um, now they didn't have a star shade, so they didn't need the star shade instrument. They imagined a launch date that was later, more like 2039. They also imagined it to be serviceable and upgradable. That's true for Havex as well, but this is kind of more important for Louvoir because this is really imagined to be in, in many, many, many generational. Uh, telescope here, much more ambitious. So a 25 lifetime goal for non-serviceable components. Um, so, you know, this would deploy something like James Webb Space Telescope, but obviously more deployments. The mirror would have to be folded a few more times to fit in the typical fairings that we have available to us. It has this enormous uh, sunshade uh, in order to keep the telescope uh, cool and stable. Um, and uh, not not cool like JWST cool, but you know cool, made, uh, fairly cool and stable, um, and uh, and to prevent and it has this sort of gimbaled structure which helps to uh, suppress vibrations. Um, so uh, these are the four instrument concepts. So there was the cor uh, chronograph. Uh, which has similar capabilities as um, as the Habex chronograph. You can see the inner working angle there is a little worse in terms of lambda over d than Habex. That's because of this segmented on axis um, on axis uh, uh, primary uh, architecture. Um, it had a high definition imager that's similar to this Habex workhorse camera. Uh, UV ultraviolet multi object spectrograph similar to the UVS on Habex, and then Pollux, which was a, tel uh, a polarimeter which we didn't have. Um, there's no uh, corresponding analog on on HabEx. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the two science goals of these two. Um, so they're very similar. So HabEx had three science goals. One was to seek out new nearby worlds, explore their habitability. So that's survey a relatively large sample of nearby stars, look for potentially Earth-like planets, sorry, and take their spectra. Um, to map out nearby planetary systems and understand the diversity they contain. Here you would actually look at sort of the 12 most promising nearby systems, and um, you would use the star shade to characterize all the planets um, and get their and uh, get their orbits. Um, so you would just do a deep dive on the nearest planetary systems. And then finally, uh, half the time would be spent on, a, on a general astrophysics. Um, Louvoir had similar science themes. Uh, one was basically uh, uh, plant, comparative planetology, um, as well as the search for life. Uh, they, they actually focused a lot on um, solar system or planetary science applications. Um, Habex did as well, but not quite to the level that Louvoir did. And then, of course, um, general astrophysics, in particular, cosmic origins. So, uh, so 
um, the HabX and LeBoire missions would both sat, uh, survey either a large sample, either dozens in the case of HabX or hundreds of stars in the case of LeBoire, um, to look for potentially habitable worlds. And then the best uh, candidates of those would then be, um, uh, you would get you know, fairly complete spectra to ensure to see if you get water vapor, carbon dioxide, ozone, uh, Raleigh scattering, and uh, and maybe even oxygen um, to see if they're inhabited or or um, inhabitable or inhabited, um, and uh, and so you would get a sample of a uh, subsample of of uh, systems where you you know you could really tell whether or not it's actually a habitable planet. This, of course, is the kind of holy grail of what you want to get. Uh, this is the this is a simulated spectrum in this case from Habex uh, using 230 hours of observations um, of of a hypothetical Earth-like planet around the nearby Beta CVN star, uh, which is G0 star at 8.4 parsecs. Um, and so you can see the UV optical and infrared channels. The UV channel is relatively low resolution because all we really want to see is this ozone cutoff. Um, the, uh, the near infrared is also relatively low resolution because we're basically just looking for these water features. Um, and then you can see the Raleigh scattering and the oxygen as well. Um, uh, and you can detect carbon dioxide in this, although it's not um, uh, very obvious in this picture. Uh, methane in the case of Habex is going to be difficult for any of the targets. Um, and Louvoir, it's going to be difficult as well, although because of the larger aperture with Louvoir A, there's going to be a, some candidates that you'd be able to de detect methane on if they look like the Earth. Of course, you know, the Earth has only looked like that uh, for a relatively short amount of time in its history. So we really want to be able to detect Earth uh, as an inhabitable planet, uh, inhabitable planet throughout its history, from the Archean to the Protozoic to modern Earth. Um, and that actually will be possible uh, with the uh, architectures that I just specified. Um, and in particular, in the Proterozoic Earth, even uh, when the present oxygen level is uh, is only uh, the oxygen level is only 0.1 percent of the present day, in which case the oxygen feature is basically undetectable, you can still get the ozone feature because the ozone feature ozone is um, is you know a very good absorber in the in the near uh, near in the near UV. Um, that does mean, however, that you absolutely have to have UV uh, high contrast imaging uh, and spectroscopy in order to really, um, really be able to get this goal of uh, showing that these planets are, uh, that the Earth is uh, habitable over its history. That's an important thing to keep in mind. Okay, so in terms of the yield, um, as you can imagine, uh, the yields uh, for Louvoir A are greater than that for Louvoir B, which are greater than that from Habex. Um, in terms of uh, in terms of actually, you know, planets in the notional habitable zone, uh, Louvoir A would have 54, Louvoir B would have 28, and Habex would have eight. So, um, and you know, there's there's uncertainties in these numbers as a result of certain uncertainties in A to Earth or exozodes, which I can talk about if you want. But for all three cases, even including Habex, the probability that we wouldn't be able to characterize at least one Earth-like planet in the habitable zone of a nearby sun-like star is basically negligible. Um, so, uh, so we really think that all three of these architectures would really be able to address this question robustly, um, obviously with Louvoir B and A more robustly than Habex. Um, one nice thing is that we're actually gonna get a ton of other planets which are well characterized um, depending on exactly uh, which uh, mission architecture you're talking about, um, from rocky planets to super Earths to sub Neptunes, Neptunes and Jupiters. Of course, these numbers are notional because we don't really know what the demographics of planets are very well enough to predict them robustly. But you can still see that um, uh, for other types of exoplanets, Louvoir is going to get hundreds um, and Habex, or you know, many, uh, you know, 650, 600 Habex more along the line of 200. And of course, they'll have a range of ages. You can study uh, evolution of atmospheres, et cetera. This is just a very rich gold mine of comparative ex exoplanetology. All right, so that's those are the mission concepts very briefly that were submitted to the decadal survey. So uh, again, we um, the the four mission concepts were presented to the decadal survey in uh, in um, October of 2019 to the US one and US two panels, and uh, and then last October the decadal survey came out finally. Um, and um, what they prioritized was, um, and I, I will say that, you know, between when these studies were submitted in late 2019 and when the decadal survey was released last year, uh, there was kind of a growing grassroots effort by members of the community, including me and other people, 
to other people involved with the SDDTs, but then just other people that were interested in this in general, to kind of you know advocate for not just one of these missions, four missions being selected, but actually a, a fleet of them being selected in this kind of um, in the kind of uh, sense of the pre previous great observatories from NASA. Compton, Spitzer, Hubble, and Chandra, this would be the next great observatories, which would cover a broad range of wavelengths, and we would want them uh, preferably to fly contemporaneously, at least have some overlap, so we could do that kind of science. Um, and so we were kind of agitating for that, and, and the actual picture for this, um, the sort of te teaser picture that I submitted for this talk is actually, uh, a, a, you know, the great observatories um, kind of logo that we came up with. And, uh, and the other thing to emphasize is that all four of these mission studies really emphasize the need to do robust technology and science mission development early on before you start the official start of the mission in order to you know, buy down risk and cost. Uh, and that recommendation was taken very seriously by the Astro 2020 Decadal Survey to the extent that the number one large space priority of the Astro 2020 Decadal Survey is not actually a mission. It's what's called the Great Observatory's Mission Technology Maturation Program, which a lot of us are calling GOMAP, um, because we need some acronym. Um, and it's very it's exactly that. It's, it's trying to mature the mission concepts and technologies even beyond what were, were done in these studies, um, such that we can really be confident that we can then start on these missions uh, and building these missions um, and, and developing these missions in a way that will, will keep to the schedule and cost. Uh, and it will be, and, and you know, sort of avoid the sins of JWST. Um, and so that was their number one priority. I'll talk a little bit about the, the, the amount of money and the timeline for that here in a second. And then it actually recommended uh, exactly as some of us were sort of agitating for is a kind of next great observatories. Uh, a, a IR optical and UV space telescope, similar to HabEx or Louvoir. Um, a far IR telescope similar to that of, of origins and an X-ray telescope similar to that of Lynx. Um, not to be fl flown at the same time, to be flown sequentially, but, um, but it's actually possible with the right amount of funding to do them contemporaneously as I'll talk about. Okay, so the first of these would then be the large um, six meter aperture, twiddle six meter aperture, uh, Louvoir Habex. We've been calling it Louvex because we don't have a good name for it yet. Um, some have been proposed, none of them good. Um, so that's, the, um, and so, you know, this, this recommendation was met with some, you know, confusion by people like, what, what, is, what is this? Um, but it's exactly what I said. It, it's uh, it's the, this basically getting ready for these mission, uh, these missions uh, developments so that we can make sure that we can do them on time and on budget. And so this is just a Twitter exchange between Jesse Christensen and Bruce McIntosh. Bruce McIntosh was on the Astro 2020 Decadal Survey Steering Committee. That kind of des describes this. Um, and then the, again, the new the six meter twiddle six meter uh, infrared optical UV to space telescope. Um, important important to recognize, um, and I've heard you know lots of different com uh, commentaries on on this recommendation. This is not Louvoir. This is not Habex. Louvoir didn't win. Habex didn't win. It's some there somewhere. It's a mission that's somewhere in the middle in terms of aperture size and and uh, scope an ambition um, that would draw upon the, the best of both, uh, both uh, mission concept studies. So this quote, quote from Julian Duff, the Astro 20 point decale survey kind of. Um, so we've, again, we've been calling it LUVEX, but a new name is coming from NASA headquarters shortly, I hope. Um, and, so, uh, and so let's talk a little bit about what this looks like. Um, it's a off axis inscribed six meter diameter. It would uh, be able to, to directly detect and characterize about 25 potentially habitable planets um, and search for uh, biosignatures on those. So where does this 25 come from? It's basically a balance between science on the one hand and cost and schedule on the other. So the Astro 2020 Decadal Survey um, argued that a four meter, the yield of a four meter was really not robust enough in terms of Earth-like planets um, for the cost. And more, and also equally important, the general astrophysics was wasn't really that compelling at the four meter uh, at the four meter point. Um, whereas they they didn't even get they didn't even have the Louvoir A mission traced, which is the technology um, uh, 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 anyway. It was the costing. Sorry, I'm blanking on the acronym. It's the it's where they cost where they where the aerospace actually judges the cost. 
uh, technology re re readiness and cost estimates. Uh, this, so that's the, the 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 work done by Aerospace Corporation to to make sure that to figure out how much these things should cost roughly and whether and what the technologies. Um, state status were in terms of TRL of these of the technologies needed to achieve these things. And so the um, the steering committee did not even have Uvar a trace because they immediately recognized that it was too costly, it would take too long for the current environment. Um, so they they actually had Luvar B, Habex, the preferred architecture, and then one of the Habex smaller architectures traced by aerospace. And based on these considerations, they landed and this kind of figure from Chris Stark, they landed at Sort of a six meter inscribed diameter, um, which would yield about 25 potentially Earth like planets around nearby sun like stars. Um, and you can see it's kind of in the knee of this, um, of this curve. Okay, so again, six meter inscribed. This is Louvoir B, uh, which was an outer uh, circumscribed diameter of eight meters, and the inscribed diameter is 6.7 meters. This is the Habex four meter, uh, just for reference. So the six meter would be somewhere smaller in here, um, fairly close to Louvoir B. So you know, if you if you really want to get a sense of what this might look like, um, you would probably look to Louvoir B. But the important thing to keep in mind is that you know they very deliberately put a twiddle in front of this. Um, so you know already there's this kind of uh, solidification of this idea that it's a six meter telescope in the community. And that should really be uh, not, not, you know, people should not take that so seriously. Uh, the precise diameter and even the architecture will be decided by future trade studies, considering not just exoplanets, but also <clears throat> the general astrophysics science. So there's a lot of work to be done to define what the science is at various aperture sizes, um, exoplanets and general astrophysics, and in particular to identify breakpoints uh, where things might pile up. Um, where you might end up preferring that architecture on one side or the other of those breakpoints. Um, so the idea would be that we would do this go map process for the next five years or so, and then sometime before the next Astro 2030 decadal survey, there would be an independent uh, committee that would decide whether or not it was good to go for this six meter Luvex concept. Um, and, uh, and then that would um, then start a new start with uh, begin phase A with, um, with NASA. Um, so this is the notional timeline, um, and uh, so uh, we are here. So these were the uh, the studies that were done. Um, this was the the decadal survey itself. We're here. This is that go map process. Here's the uh, here's the uh, review that would decide the external review that would decide whether or not the Luvex is ready to go or not. If so, then it would start implementation. Um, and meanwhile, these, the GOMAC would also support development of the other two X-ray and far IR missions. Then we have the decadal survey, which would then down select between one of these two to go next with the next mission going after that. Um, and then maybe new concept studies, which would then get input in the Astro 2030 decadal survey. And so uh, it's really important to recognize that Astro 2020 did something kind of profoundly different. Um, they didn't really look at this as a decadal survey. They called it very explicitly a pan-decadal survey, which makes sense because these missions have now gotten to the level of sophistication and cost and, and development time that they really aren't well encapsulated by a, a decade, um, a 10-year timeline. In fact, most large mission concepts are not really, were not, have not been in a 10-year timeline. But certainly not the case for these four large mission concepts. So the idea is that you try to, you know, develop, leverage um, the science goals, um, and develop a, a coordinated plan, which which includes technology and and uh, architecture, uh, this go map development, so that we can, you know, be ready for the next flagship mission whenever it starts, um, in sort of a sequential process, and that you know, past decisions from past decadal surveys wouldn't get relitigated in the next decadal surveys through this process. Of course, you wanna make sure that the science is still relevant and compelling at that price point, but, um, but you don't wanna revisit the prioritization uh, completely. All right, so, so we look towards the end of the next 2020 decadal, uh, 2020, uh, uh, the end of this decade to start the new uh, LUVEX mission. And so uh, the Astro 2020, put a lot of money into this GOMAP process, $1.2 billion this decade. And this is super important. You know, you can't just do sort of light technology development funding. You really have to do large, uh, large amount of funding, top-down strategic investment in this technologies to really make sure that they're ready for this decision point 
uh, at the end of this decade. So uh, that money, a lot of it is going to go back to the community, and it's important to recognize that. Um, so this is where the opportunities kind of come in. So uh, what now? Realizing this vision requires a significant increase in the NASA astrophysics budget, particularly if we want to try to do this contemporaneous new great observatories, um, and may roughly maybe double the budget, uh, annual budget um, that would be required. So that need, requires significant advocacy. So I'm kind of imploring people on this, listening to this talk, to think about how they might advocate for this, assuming they agree that this is a good goal. There's a lot of precursor science work that needs to be done. Um, what does that work? Well, we don't really know, uh, but it needs to be defined. I mean, I can give you some examples of things I think are important, but as a community, we have to decide what precursor science needs to be done so that we can do these architecture trades, figure out where we want to put our technology development, um, and you know, just get the things, figure out what we need to know in order to make a decision about what, for example, LUVEX is going to look like. So there's a variety of activities that are being planned or have already been planned. Um, the, the next one coming up is this, uh, this workshop called Precursors to Pathways. Uh, this is uh, hosted by NASA. It's Science Enabling NASA Astrophysics Future Grid Observatories, April 20th through 22nd. The first day is gonna be kind of summary of where, how we got here, like I just gave you. The second day is gonna be breakout sessions where people try to discuss uh, the, the science precursor work that needs to be done. And then the third day, people can get back together and kind of, you know, could prioritize that those lists. Um, that's going to be virtual. Again, if this is something that interests you at all, I encourage you to attend. Uh, then there's uh, I, I and others have uh, put in uh, and we're just recently accepted a splinter session at Exoplanets Four at the beginning of May. Uh, that will be a great observatory precursor science theme uh, with a kind of emph emphasis on on um, exoplanet science, obviously. And there's likely to be a lot of activities in the summer AAS at Pasadena. So I encourage you to get involved. There will be an AO coming out from NASA that will actually support um, uh, grants to develop a precursor science. Uh, and, uh, and I encourage you to look forward to that. That's gonna, those AOs should come out, out sometime after April. And with that, um, I will take questions. Um, so, I would encourage folks to uh, unmute themselves and ask, or if you want, you can raise your hands. We do have a, com uh, a question on the chat from Paul, uh, Paul Vanden. Let me read that. And maybe you can uh, uh, address that. Uh, we know from ALMA observations that planets form in an environment rich in organic molecules. So planets with methane and CO in their atmospheres are probably there in abundance for HABEX detection. How do we go from identifying habitable planets that are detected to planets that are actually inhabited? Uh, that is the question, isn't it? <laughs> um, I mean, you know, this is, A, this is not really my area of expertise, and B, I think this is a question that everyone is still grappling with. Um, you know, what, what is, what is a, you know, how do we go from biosignatures to biomarkers? Maybe you would want to say a phrase that way. I would just throw this back and I say, this is an excellent question for the science precursor uh, 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 activities. Uh, we really want to try to define at least some metrics by which we as a community can agree that, oh, this is promising, or this is likely to be a bio, uh, you know, inhabited planet, or, or identify the false positives. Um, and a lot of this work obviously has been done, but I think more needs to be done. And this kind of plays into the architecture itself. I already mentioned that methane is going to be hard. So a lot of people say if you detect oxygen and methane, that's a strong indication. You have disequilibrium chemistry and therefore likely some sort, some kind of life. Again, not my area of expertise, but methane's hard. Methane's very hard to detect. Uh, the strongest features are in the, you know, beyond 1.5 microns, where you the thermal emission from the telescope starts to ramp up. So how hard should we push down there? Um, and that's going to then affect the architecture itself. Um, and, uh, and is this something we want to do in one mission? Or is this something that you know we do one mission that finds things that have oxygen in their atmospheres, and then we figure out how we're going to do the next mission that will look at those particular systems and decide and try to you know identify that they're that those are not false positives, they're actually due to life. Um, I think it's important to recognize that this is um. This is a process, right? We're not going to like wake up one day, twenty years from now, and say, "Hey, we found life around this planet," right? We're going to find candidates that are like, "Oh, well, this is very interesting and very promising," and we're going to study those planets for decades to come, centuries to come. I realize I just evaded that question. 
Brendan, go for it. Thanks. Great, great talk, Scott. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering what, what you think in, in the sort of realm of preparatory work that needs to be done in anticipation of where this telescope is going to be pointed. What sort of efforts should the community be thinking about to say map out the habitable zones of 200 of the best sun-like stars or whatever that number might be with high contrast imaging plus high cadence RVs and maybe simultaneous photometric monitoring to make sure that there's no brown dwarf or sub-Saturn or super earth or whatever, where we want to look, right? So that, you know, there's no region of dynamical, dynamically unstable orbits in the habitable zones that we're gonna be pointing this expensive observatory at. Right, um, so, you know, the, the, the larger question is, you know, how do we vet the, the, the target, target um, list of stars that we're gonna point at? You know, there, there's not that many stars, you know, of order 100 for Louvoir kind of apertures and, and uh, you know, 50 or 60 for Hebex. Um, and these all stars all have, you know, names, um, not just license plate numbers. Um, so, uh, you know, I, my sense is again, you know, these are stars are gonna be the most well-studied stars in the sky. I mean, they already are to some extent, but will be even more so than what most well-studied stars in the sky for centuries. Should we just throw it? We should throw everything at it. Now, that's not a very good strategy, but I think that's the, the general philosophy we should have. Um, the first thing we should do is we should start monitor these things with precision radio velocity using the best facilities that we have. Now, a lot of these have been monitored for dozens of years, but some haven't because they make really good direct imaging targets, but not so good precision RV targets. Um, but nevertheless, I think we need to monitor those as well, even if they're more active or noisy. Uh, noisy in terms of radio velocity. Um, but, you know, the facilities we have are, are probably not good enough to really get down to um, our, I think, almost certainly not good enough to get down to Earth-like planets around sun-like stars at 1AU. Um, and so, you know, there's a whole initiative, which the Decadal Survey kind of ignored, unfortunately, of, of um, extreme precision radial velocity and trying to develop a sub 10 centimeter per second precision uh, and accuracy um, with radio velocity. And I think that's a, that's a strong goal, not only to, um, because eventually we're gonna wanna get the masses of these planets if we detect them. It would be better if we got them, if we knew what they, that they were there and what their masses were and their orbits were before we did the mission, but it's not required. Um, so I think a dedicated investment in EPRV at any level right now is, is important um, and really at a, at a much larger level than EPRV is being funded today. There's also things like, um, you know, what are the UV radiation environments of these stars or high energy radiation environments of these in the habitable zones of these stars. That's also work that needs to be done as well. Um, we'd like to have a better sense of what the exozoti, exozoti uh, uh, the amount of exozoti in these systems is as well, although we don't really have the facilities to do that right now. Maybe Roman might be the best thing that we have coming up so far. Um, but, but those are the kinds of things I think we want to think about. Yeah, and, and I guess just to quickly follow up, um, you know, it's it's sort of the Wild West right now, the way that groups all over the world using different facilities and different funding resources uh, tackle the various problems in the field. But this kind of, you know, if this is going to be an $11 billion investment, it seems like it needs to be a concerted, well thought out, and very sort of deliberate plan that's initiated using all those resources you mentioned, including the 30 meters that are coming up soon. Um, Absolutely. I, I agree with that. Thank you for saying that. It's very important. Um, and part of well, the reason why I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm is, you know, encouraging people to get involved is because those kind, that kind of top-down strategic plan is what's going to be defined in the next few months uh, or year. Um, and so it's important we get it right. Um, Um, I can't see anyone. I can't see all the hands. So. Oh, okay. Well, I don't know who is next, but Scott. You are. Um, a quick question. I mean, it makes very good sense uh, to look for biomarkers um, uh, in uh, planets that are nearby stars. My question is, um, there could be a possibility that uh, maybe the life is not on planets, but you know, on satellites of planets. The missions that you have, that you are, that you talked about, will they be able to kind of spot or look for biomarkers on satellites of planets? 
Um, so, you know, the, I haven't thought about this too carefully. You know, there are, um, so, I mean, so th there are ways in which you can, with direct imaging, there's ways in which you can detect a, a satellite, a moon to a giant planet, for example, by looking for mutual events um, or things like that, or, or, or features in the phase curves. Um, and, you know, in principle, you know, if you have an Earth sized planet around a giant planet, which, you know, I'm not even sure that's stable, depending on the or architecture, uh, but or maybe something smaller than that. Um, well, I guess an Earth around a, well, maybe it'll stable. But, um, you know, in principle, then, you know, you're going to get as much contribution in terms of the light if it's a 1AU that you would for an Earth-like planet, except it's going to be combined with the spectrum of the of the giant planet as well. And disentangling those two is going to be super hard um, just because you don't just have that many photons from the Earth-like planet. So I, I would say it's probably going to be quite challenging to do that uh, sort of Earth, uh, end or around a Jupiter at 1AU, for example. Uh, but I haven't thought about that too carefully. Other questions? Maybe one more if we got. Kyle. Hi, Scott. Great talk. Um, so uh, I wanted to ask about the potential. I know that there are uh, mission concepts that have been floated um, for high precision, dedicated um, ast astrometric missions. Uh, with the specific goal of um, uh, of measuring the sort of astrometric wobbles from low mass uh, habitable zone planets. And the, the mission concept I'm thinking of right now is Thea. Um, I'm wondering what the uh, potential is for a, for, uh, you know, LUVEX or, you know, whatever ends up being the, uh, uh, this mission uh, to benefit from a kind of astrometric sort of campaign like that. Right. So, um, you know, we, we, we shall not, we, there's a mission that shall be, not be named that was in development for a long time, which got canceled in the Astro 2020, actual 2010 decadal survey, which would also do something similar to Thea. Um, so yeah, the, the, um, so this is a larger question of, you know, you know, we, I already mentioned that we want to measure the masses of, of any potentially habitable planets that we detect, but that doesn't have to be done beforehand. So then, um, but it does have to be done. And the only two really ways we have to do it are astrometry at the sub, at the sort of sub micro arc second level or micro arc second level, because the earth around a sun-like star is, um, is like a, a, what, three micro arc seconds or something. Um, and, uh, um, at 10 parsecs, um, or EPRV, which is a sub 10 centimeter per second uh, problem, both of which are terrifying, uh, but maybe less terrifying for precision reading velocity. I'm not sure. Also, it's the case, it's important to recognize that the, the subset of stars which you can do precision astrometry on, which you can do precision rate of velocity on, is not the same. There's a lot of overlap, but it's not the same set of stars. So, in principle, you really want to do both. Mm. Um, then you can ask whether or not you want to do those beforehand. So when you, if you do beforehand, having precursor knowledge of where the planets are actually doesn't help your yields very much, depending on the architecture that you're looking at for the direct imaging survey, but it does help your efficiency um, and so that you can find the planets early on in the mission, which might have some benefits. Um, all because, but partially because both of these missions were designed to be actually survey and characterization machines, not just characterized. Uh, so then, you know, let's say we decide that um, EPRV, we can't do it sub 10, sub 10 centimeters per second uh, precision. But then we would want to go to astrometry. And then how do we do that? So you can imagine doing it at a probe class level with a feel like mission, which is fairly targeted and niche, I would say, at a, at a $1 billion price tag. Um, but you might also have the photons to do it within LUVEX itself. Um, so with LUVAR A and B, you have enough photons from these stars, which are, after all, bright. Um, and even from the background reference stars, which are, you know, still, you know, you're getting a lot of photons because this enormous, enormous aperture to do relative astrometry at the sub micro, at the arc sub, at the one, one micro arc second level. But there it's all a question of calibration. And so there are ideas of how you calibrate your detector to sort of the one ten thousandth or one one hundred thousandth of a pixel 
to be able to measure these astrometric shifts. And that is one thing that I think needs to be looked at very carefully, because if you can all do this all in-house with astrometry on board the LUVEX, that makes your life a lot easier. Um, so I'm gonna, since we're right at our two o'clock uh, schedule, uh, I'm going to uh, thank Scott for giving us a great talk. And uh, I, you all know how to reach him if you wish. Yep, feel free uh, to email. follow up. Um, and so we will see you next time. Thank you very much, Scott. Thank you very much.